Good afternoon. My name is Rhonda Daviston, and on behalf of my co-chair, Wesley Alexander, and the Multi-Agency Black History Planning Committee, welcome to our annual Black History Program. The theme for 2023 is Black Resistance. This theme is timely and appropriate due to the current social and political climate in our country. Resistance means the refusal to accept or comply with something. It also means the ability to not be affected by something adversely. From the beginning of the forceful arrival of Africans on the shores of this country, African Americans have used resistance to challenge the system and achieve successes, triumphs, and progress in many fields and in many ways. Some of the ways we have resisted have been through protests, the legal system, education, faith, music, and the arts. The theme causes us to acknowledge and remember the ways that African Americans have refused to let oppression and discrimination prevent them from fighting for the things that matter to them. Through Black resistance, we have dismantled Jim Crow segregation laws, ended slavery, and increased political representation at all levels of government. Through Black resistance, we have also broken barriers in education, the media, healthcare, and sports, to name a few. Our program will highlight and demonstrate the struggles and success of Black resistance in education, the media, voting, and the church. Our history is rich and powerful. Black history is American history, and we are so happy to share it with you today. We have an exciting program that includes dynamic speakers, singers, African dancers, and a rapper. We hope you find this program to be engaging, provocative, educational, and entertaining. Our registration website provides information regarding voting and provides a link to the 2022-2023 Central PA Black Business Directory. Our program booklet is also on the website. It includes the order of the program, bios of the program participants, and other interesting information. Next, the Earth Tones will sing the Negro National Anthem. The Earth Tones are a group of state employees from various agencies who have serenaded the Commonwealth for the last 20 years. Unfortunately, the group is retiring and this performance will be their last. We thank them for their service and we wish each member well. We would like to thank Governor Josh Shapiro for his welcome address, as well as Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis and Representative Donna Bullock, Chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, for their remarks. Thank you for attending our program. We hope you enjoy it. Bye. 
Good afternoon, and thank you to the Pennsylvania Multi-Agency Black History Committee, the Public Utility Commission, and all of our participating agencies for taking the time to celebrate and also reflect. Black History Month is a reminder of the countless contributions Black Pennsylvanians have made to our Commonwealth and our nation. From our Black soldiers who fought for freedom in the Revolution and the Civil War, to those who served as conductors in the Underground Railroad, to the Black Pennsylvanians who worked in the shipyards in Philly, the coal and steel industries in places like Steelton and Pittsburgh, and the railroad industry in Erie and Harrisburg, to the leaders of the Civil Rights Movement who advanced the cause of real freedom and worked to create opportunity for all. All of them played an important role in Pennsylvania's story, one of progress and of prosperity. That's why on February 1st, I was proud to sign my first Black History Month proclamation, honoring them and remembering the countless contributions Black Pennsylvanians have made to our story. And while we write the next chapter together, it's up to us to ensure that we continue to make that progress. In our administration, Black Pennsylvanians are leading the way, heading departments and teams all across this Commonwealth. Leaders like Austin Davis, the first Black Pennsylvanian to serve as Lieutenant Governor, who is inspiring future generations to serve. As we continue to see through a new beginning for Pennsylvania, we must also recommit ourselves to furthering opportunity for every community and every Pennsylvanian. That's how we honor these great achievements in Pennsylvania's history, by continuing their work to open the doors of opportunity for all and to advance the cause of real freedom by ensuring that everyone is at the table. The work you do in your agencies is critical to accomplishing these noble objectives. So thank you for all you do to advance the cause of freedom and create real opportunity here in our Commonwealth for all Pennsylvanians. Good afternoon, I'm Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis. Thank you for inviting me to speak with you today. As the Commonwealth's first black lieutenant governor, I am humbled by the faith and trust that people of Pennsylvania have placed in me. And I'm always conscious of the fact that I did not get here alone. I stand on the shoulders of giants. Giants like Kay Leroy Irvis, who was the first black speaker of the house in any state in the country. Heroes like Robert Nix Jr., who was the first black chief justice of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Their historic achievements paved the way for generations of black elected officials like myself to reach even higher. Still, none of these achievements would have been possible without access to the ballot box. Voting is the foundation of political power in America, and it has always been central to the idea of black resistance. Black Americans have always fought back and resisted, forcing our country to live up to its founding principles that all men that all people are created equal, that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I understand that when our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia in the summer of 1776, they did not intend for their words to apply to me. But also I know that black resistance has forced our nation's leaders to grapple with those words, has held up a mirror to injustice and called for change. That work is not over. It isn't over by a long shot. Now let's work. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus during this Black History Month. We are excited to join the multi-agency Black History Month Planning Committee to bring this virtual Black History Month celebration to all of our employees and supporters and other stakeholders in uh, Pennsylvania state government. The Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus is celebrating its 50th year anniversary this year, which is so uh, on point as we are also celebrating black resistance during this particular Black History Month. We see Black History Month as an opportunity for us to highlight the success of black Americans throughout the Commonwealth, but specifically in state government. And when it came to the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, we are the embodiment of black resistance. Whether you're talking about Crystal Bird Fawcett, the first black woman to be elected to any state legislature in 1938, that happened right here in Pennsylvania. Or Kay Leroy Irvis, the first black person elected Speaker of the House here in Pennsylvania and since Reconstruction in the nation. So this is an opportunity for us to celebrate that black resistance right here in the Commonwealth and to celebrate our achievements 
and all of the other success of black uh, state legislators, black elected officials, and black state workers and public officials right here in Pennsylvania. Thank you for allowing the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus to participate in today's events, and we look forward to working with all of our colleagues in the administration, in the legislature, and throughout state government to serve the people of Pennsylvania.
Greetings, friends. Again, I'm the Reverend Carla Christopher, assistant to the bishop in charge of justice ministries for Lower Susquehanna Synod, part of the Central Pennsylvania region in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. I'm only the fourth black woman who is part of the LGBTQ community to be ordained into that denomination in more than 500 years. And it is absolutely the history, the rich, vibrating, powerful history of resistance and resilience that is part of historically black churches and denominations that empowered me to go from community organizer and activist to rostered leader in a denomination not historically centering black people. So how did this resilience from such a long tradition transfer itself onto me? Well, I simply could not be a black pastor without the history of the black church. The very first collection of folk songs published in the United States was actually called Slave Songs of the United States, published in 1867. And it contained a familiar hymn that many of you may know. As I went down by the river to pray, studying about that good old way, and who will wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Have you ever heard the story of how that was written? An enslaved man by the name of George Allen is credited with first sharing the words of that song. And According to his claims, it was written because the black church was given to us, the Christian religion, by slave owners, by human traffickers who took away the original culture and religious and spiritual traditions of African descent individuals. Did that bar us from spiritual expression? Did that keep us from building community that nurtured the soul and could be passed down through generations? Absolutely not. We took what was available to us. We took what was readily able to be received in our communities and we turned those resources into something beautiful that could inspire and empower our resistance against the very people who enslaved us. Many of those so-called Negro spirituals, like Down by the River, included codes that said things like, Starry Crowns, the North Star, Down by the River, travel through the water so that the tracking dogs on land won't be able to sniff you. These codes, these instructions, were part of saving and building community, preserving legacy for generation, the very thing that the church does. It didn't end there. Do any of you know that one of the amazing leaders of the civil rights movement, Frederick Douglass, was actually part of the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, an ordained minister, also a noted abolitionist, of course, but it was Frederick Douglass who began some of the most powerful interfaith and faith-based community organizing, partnering with people from different denominations through a shared identity and a sense of resilience, gathering black religious leaders and other collaborators to help create the Underground Railroad that helped thousands of people escape bondage and using that pulpit as a place to share inspiration, education, and intentional empowered community building was a strong source of Frederick Douglass's education and also the way that messages could be shared across neighborhoods and across communities, told and retold from that sacred place of trust, religious and spiritual leadership, a kind of care that speaks to the spirit across generation and across other division in the ways that certain forms of education or regional-based organizing could not. 
I think we all know that church-based and spiritual organizing resistance and resilience certainly didn't end with Frederick Douglass. A fellow member of the LGBTQ community, Bayard Rustin, who was, many refer to as the power behind the throne, a lifelong partner and co-worker, colleague, and co-conspirator with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., was actually one of the primary leaders in the African-American civil rights, nonviolence, and justice liberation during the 60s and into the 70s. Bayard Rustin organized freedom rides in 1940s and 1950s, moved to help organize the Christian Leadership Conference, strengthened Martin Luther King Jr.'s leadership and teaching, was part of the organization for the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, and actually was a huge union organizer and another interfaith organizer, partnering with the American Jewish Congress and other labor leaders to fight for rights for unions and American workers. During the 70s and 80s, Bayard Rustin served on countless humanitarian issues and missions, aiding refugees from Vietnam to Cambodia until his death on a humanitarian mission in Haiti in 1987. It was the church and partners from the church that empowered, inspired, educated around, and funded Bayard Rustin's work. Even as an LGBTQ black man, there was always a space for his action and advocacy because the black church's call to resistance against oppressive powers is not constrained by anything that might otherwise divide us. We've seen division today, haven't we? We've seen Rodney King in LA, a lot of the resistance and support of protesters and community advocates was provided by LA churches. The same around the death of George Floyd in Milwaukee, buses of supplies were brought in by multiple local congregations. William Barber has led the freedom movement that eventually became Moral Mondays and the revival of the New Poor People's Campaign out of North Carolina. And our very own Drew Hart here in Pennsylvania out of Messiah College is the author of some of the most powerful books on modern day advocacy and proactive resistance for the sake of justice. These black leaders are all inspired by the fact that spirit shares across generations, across cultural and locational divides, and betrays all party boundaries to show that we can be one in a faith that commits to freedom and justice. Love lived out. Justice is what love looks like in the public sphere. And if spirituality is love, then surely the black church and its active resistance is love in its purest form. There's a church in Pennsylvania called Mother Bethel, located in Philadelphia. It stands on the oldest parcel of land continuously owned by African Americans in the United States. The black individuals who shaped and grew the city of Philadelphia, many of them find their faith roots in Mother Bethel. A preacher, an abolitionist, an activist, and an entrepreneur, their founder, Bishop Richard Allen, was a huge part of the Underground Railroad and abolitionist movement. And that legacy continues today. That legacy continues in many of the leaders I mentioned, even in myself, and it continues in you. The black church is the heartbeat and the soul beat of America. It is where justice is birthed over and over again in an eternal resurrection, a source of resistance that give hope and heart and possibility as well as peace to those on the margins. And this Black History Month, whatever spiritual denomination you come from, know that you raise your fist even as you place your hand on your heart because the resilient, the powerful, 
the resistant black churches of America have made it possible. Yeah, this is Loki Flame. Gold on my wrist with my black power fist up. Hey, look, I got designer on my look, look. I got designer on my body, but I ain't too fly to protest. Bought that Ralph Lauren with reparations that they owed us. Rocking all my jewelry when I pull up to the march. I don't put it on a beat unless I feel it in my heart. Shady politicians playing both sides like a Gemini. Wolf and sheep's clothing always gonna be hard to recognize. How we come at peace, be the main ones getting penalized. We show up with picket signs, the cops can show up weaponized. Murder all my brothers in the streets, I ain't feeling that. Body filled with so much anger, there ain't no concealing that. They pull up for photo ops and think that they can hang with us. They don't wanna step outside and actually make some change with us. Been a minute since I wrote a track to get to stepping with. Quarantine with COVID, some of my protests is my permission. All around the country, black people be my brethren. Speaking any bonnets so they know I'm representing them Hit that bass knocking, better turn it up a little I'ma give it to you straight up, ain't no time to talk in riddles Pick your side in the freedom fight cause you can't play the middle Really skating on this beat, rest in peace to Tyree Nichols Look, rolling on my wrist with that black power fist up Ay, 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 yeah we need a revolution We ain't stopping till we get one, we get one, we get one, we get one Ay, I said that going up on my wrist with that black power fist up Ay Hey, hey, yeah, we need them reparations. We ain't stopping till we get some. We get some, we get some, we get some. Hey, I got the, yeah, look, hey, I got designer on my body, but I ain't too fly to protest. Huh? Yeah, look, I got designer on my body, but I, look, I got designer on my body, but I ain't too fly to protest. Bought that Ralph Lauren with reparations that they owed us. Rocking all my jewelry when I pull up to the march. I don't put it on the beat unless I feel it in my heart. Hey. Yeah. Hello, I'm Verna Edmonds, giving a brief history of the broadcast media in Harrisburg. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails, Proverbs 19.21. In 1968, the Kerner Commission released a report after seven months of investigation that attributed the riots to the lack of economic opportunity for African Americans, failed social service programs, police brutality, racism, and the orientation of national media to white perspectives. The 426-page report suggested the hiring of African American reporters. I lived in Pittsburgh at the time, and KDKA-TV in 1969 collaborated with Pittsburgh Press writer Regis Bavonis to develop a program, and from that came the Together Show for and about the African-American Pittsburgh community. Bev Smith, renowned radio host, and Joe Freeman became on-air personalities. I worked as a production assistant. After a move to Harrisburg in 1971, I worked in the office of the Honorable C. Dolores Tucker, who was Secretary of State and an inspiration to me. In 1972, Joe Higgins, General Manager of WHP TV Radio and Bruce Cummings, News Director, interviewed me several times for to be in that, for a position as a general assignment reporter for. As the first African-American female general assignment reporter, my beat was city council under mayors Harold Swinson and Paul Tim Daltry state government under Governors Milton Schapp and Dick Thornburg, and interviews with Honorable K. Leroy Irvis, the first African-American speaker of the House, and school board meetings under Superintendent Ben Turner. I hosted a weekly AM-FM radio program geared for the African-American community. Once I started the radio program, I was instructed to take voice lessons to change the sound of my speech. Olin Harris was the first African-American male weatherman and Julia Elliott, the first African-American cameraman. The station was located in the Telegraph Building on Locust Street next to the State Theater. When I started, I was not incorporated in a newsroom. I was in a room where tapes were held. Then, when the station moved to 6th Street, I was incorporated in the newsroom. There were many who helped in stressful times to choose what battles to fight. 
Homer Floyd, Executive Director of the Human Relations Commission, told me to use the opportunity of discrimination as a motivation. Many first, Andrew Bradley, Glenn Williams Sr., Millicent Hooper, and Clyde Page was always there to give encouraging words and words of wisdom. Because of the Kerner Commission Report, Fred Friendly, along with the Ford Foundation, began a program at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism to fill newsroom with voices of African Americans to get another perspective. In 1973, I was accepted in the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism, Michelle Clark Program, where 45 print candidates and 45 broadcast candidates were chosen out of 500 who applied. We received the honor of being a Ford Fellow. The program was named after Michelle Clark, who was a reporter for CBS News and died in an airplane crash. This opportunity gave me skills needed that I used to enhance my reporting. Thank you. My name is Julian Elliott. The title of my presentation is Remember. New International Version of the Bible, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 to 13. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. I graduated from Stilton High School in 1968. A few months later, I entered into the Marines. In 1970, after my discharge as corporal in the Marines, I started work at WHP in the mailroom. I distributed the mail for TV, AM, and FM radio, and all other departments. Went to the post office and bank daily. Some years later, as I advanced to engineering as studio camera operator, my other duties were editing movies that were on film that would air locally, laid out shows on videotape to get them ready for airing. When WHP moved from downtown Locust Street in Harrisburg to North 6th Street in Harrisburg, I continued the work of studio camera operator until I retired in 2015. I felt I did my best being on time, listening and learning. Be respectful and honest, do quality work. Everyone will not like you. Black resistance to me. The struggles within me and the forces on the outside, but I needed in inner strength. I would prefer no struggles or hard times at all. We struggle with each other on different levels. Love, friendship, and kindness is the goal. The people that I work with, I want to thank them for the experience of meeting them and calling them friend. A few of these people are Trotty Mundy, Verna Edmonds, Olin Harris, and Rob Hershey. Thank you.
I'm Chad Dion Lassiter, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, and I'm humbled and honored to be in this space celebrating Black History Month in the year 2023. When we look at the theme of resistance, we've had African Americans who have resisted historical oppression in all its forms. We also would be remiss if we did not acknowledge Dr. Carter G. Woodson, PhD from Harvard University, who wanted to really highlight not just the achievements, but the narratives, the rich narratives of African Americans. What started as Negro History Week turned into Negro History Month, and it was chosen in the month of February. Now, there's been some debate that it started in February simply because it's a very short month. It actually was started in February because of Abraham Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and the research that Dr. Woodson did in that space. When we think about resistance, African Americans have always resisted forms of oppression and marginalization. The vote, something that's essential to our democracy, which fundamentally and foundationally is a right, the right to vote, was denied African Americans. When we look at the challenges around voting from a historical standpoint to the contemporary, we still see glaring challenges. We see voter suppression, we see voter denial, and we see a lot of challenges as it relates to individuals going to the polls to vote. Voting is not only essential, it's very fundamental to the core principles of our democracy. I look at voting from a multi-layered perspective. I think we certainly should vote, but we also should be educating people on who to vote for. The person that you're voting for, do their uh, philosophies, do their policies, do they align with your moral compass and your moral imperative? Then there's also voter registration. And certainly we should be registering people to vote. But I think in the times that we find ourselves, we need to also build protective factors and capacity building around what to do to combat voter aggression and voter suppression. And that's where the theme of resistance comes in. We should be putting up a challenge to resist all forms of oppression and marginalization, and specifically when it comes to the fundamental right to vote. We want to continue to teach the next generation how important voting is. It's our civic duty as citizens in this wonderful democracy. Not a democracy that's without challenges, but a democracy that is being and also becoming. May you enjoy this Black History Month event, and may we continue to uphold all of the principles to protect the sacredness of voting. Feel it. Feel the healing power of the drums. We feel the vibrational energy and we become one. Flow with the jimbe and the dunes rhythmic motions. Mm. We feel the release of our physical and our emotions. We listen to the drums of the earth. We feel the design and shape of the universe in sync with the beat of our hearts. We feel the throbbing at our center that it imparts. Be aware that this week next, we feel the power as our lives intersect. We are being transformed, that we understand. We feel the mysteries of our sacred land. As these drums are played, our energy is renewed. We feel the calming of our Afrocentric mood. There is a connecting of our human spirit. We feel our barriers broken and we don't fear it. Feel it, feel it, feel it. Hello. My name is Renardo Rick Hicks, and I serve as Chief Counsel in the Law Bureau of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission. I am honored to speak on the subject of black resistance in education. But first, please note that the ideas, opinions, comments, and statements that I make here are my own. They're not the opinions or views of the Public Utility Commission or any commissioner, staff, or anyone else. That is, unless I tell you that someone else said it.
Okay, so when it comes to the education of black people in America, resistance is, and has always been, a double-edged sword. Black Americans have long used education as a form of resistance to oppression. And for a very long time, many white Americans actively and legally resisted the idea of educating black folks in order to maintain segregation and systems of racial inequality. Here are the facts. From 1776 to 1865, that's 89 years, it was legal for human beings to own other human beings and their offspring as property and to buy and sell them in open markets. This uncomfortable truth, slavery, is a part of our American history. And you know, some believe that President Lincoln freed the slaves in his Emancipation Proclamation speech in 1863 which declared that all persons held as slaves within the rebellious states are henceforward shall be free. But in fact, it was really two years later with the adoption of the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution that slavery was actually outlawed because that amendment provided that neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime shall exist in the United States. And after slavery, the US Supreme Court took center stage in our American history of black resistance in education. For example, on May 18th of 1896, the United States Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson decided that state mandated segregation laws did not, I repeat, did not violate the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This case was not even about education. A Louisiana law, the Separate Car Act, permitted separate railway cars for blacks and whites, and Homer Plessy, a one-eighth black citizen, was considered black under that law. And after taking a seat in the white section and refusing to move, Plessy was arrested and imprisoned. And he challenged his arrest and conviction, claiming that the law itself violated the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which prohibits states from denying equal protection of the law to any person within their jurisdiction. So in this case, the US Supreme Court gave approval to all kinds of laws designed to achieve racial segregation by means of separate and supposedly equal public facilities and services for blacks and whites. So separate buses, separate trains, separate water fountains, separate restaurants, separate schools, and more became legally sanctioned. This was the law for about 60 years in the United States until 1954 when it was overturned by a unanimous Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education of Topeka. In this case, Oliver Brown and five other black children were denied admission into public schools attended by white children. These cases came from five different states and the laws on which these denials occur were the laws that were authorized by Plessy which allowed segregation based on race. So 60 years after Plessy, the legal claim in Brown was the same as the claim in Plessy, that segregation in public schools deprived black children of equal protection under the 14th Amendment. And the evidence in this case revealed that black schools receive 40 to 60% of the funding that white schools receive. But this time, a unanimous Supreme Court decided, quote, segregation of students in public schools does violate, I repeat, does violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment because separate facilities are inherently unequal. In Brown, the Supreme Court ordered integration of public schools but didn't say exactly how to implement it. So it took a year later when the court was asked again 
in what they call Brown II, how to implement desegregation. And the court directed local federal judges to endure, ensure that school authorities integrated, quote, with all deliberate speed, whatever that means. Well, even after Brown and one and two, we must remember incidents like the Little Rock Nine. So two years after Brown, in 1957, a federal court ordered desegregation of public schools in Little Rock, Arkansas. And the governor of Arkansas ordered the Arkansas National Guard to prevent nine black kids who were enrolled in Central High School from attending that school. Mobs of angry people greeted the students on the first day of school. And these, these kids were literally prevented from attending school until President Eisenhower did two things. He made the Arkansas National Guard part of the Federal Army. So they were on his side. And then he sent 1,000 paratroopers of the 101st Airborne Division to the US, of the 101st Airborne Division of the US Army to protect those kids. And the next year, the same governor closed all the schools in Little Rock to prevent any more black children from attending white schools. And those schools remained closed until the next year when the US Supreme Court ordered them to reopen. These are the facts. We must also remember what it took for James Meredith to attend the University of Mississippi. In January of 1961, James Meredith, a black man, applied for admission to the University of Mississippi, and officials at that school simply returned his application. Mr. Meredith took his case to court, and on September 10, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that he had a right to attend the University of Mississippi. But despite the Supreme Court's ruling, when he came to register for classes, the governor of Mississippi personally blocked Mr. Meredith from registering at the university. And ultimately, in September of 62, a Sunday, Mr. Meredith was actually escorted back onto the campus by federal marshals and civil rights division lawyers. And stationed on or near the campus to protect him were 123 deputy federal marshals, 316 U.S. border patrolmen, 97 prison guards were also added. And within an hour, the federal forces were attacked by a mob that would grow to as much as 2,000. And those people fought them with guns, bricks, bottles, and Molotov cocktails. Now the marshals had been ordered not to shoot, so they used tear gas to try to stop the rioting. But the violence continued until President Kennedy sent 16,000 federal troops to the campus. And when it was over, two people were dead, 28 marshals had been shot, 160 people were injured, and James Meredith became the first black student to attend the University of Mississippi. These are the facts. Many people have said, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I believe that's true. And the most groundbreaking changes in education law after Brown came from the United States Congress because the Civil Rights Act of 1964 literally made desegregation a prerequisite to receiving school, fund school funding from the federal government. That law also declared there would be no segregation in public places and no discrimination in employment based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. This was huge. Finally, we must remember that historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs, most of them established after the Civil War, were created primarily for the purpose of serving the African American community. And the Civil Rights Act of 64 also provided financial assistance to these HBCUs, and today there's still about 100 of them 
in operation in the United States. Let me get personal just for one minute. Because as a kid in Philadelphia, I remember taking the Iowa test in junior high school. And my test results revealed that I had a strong aptitude and interest in the law. So when my counselor discussed the test results with me, she said, you know, this means that you could grow up and become a cop or a prison guard. Those were the only choices that she gave me. And while I believe she had good intentions, she simply assumed that I would never go to college or pursue any higher education. Well, today I have an earned bachelor's degree in government from Hamilton College. I have an earned law degree from Northeastern University in Boston. I have a second earned law degree from Temple University in Philly. And I have three honorary doctorate degrees and one honorary master's degree from other colleges and universities across the country. I tell you this not to brag, but to put in perspective where I'm coming from. For most of my life, I have resisted being told what I can accomplish based upon my race. And education is what has enabled me to do that. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world. Again, I agree. And in this country, education is a fundamental right. A person who is deprived of an education is being robbed of a basic human right. So don't let anyone steal from you. Dr. Martin Luther King said, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Dr. King also said, if you can, fly. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by all means, keep moving. Why do I say this? Because this is how you become better and maybe even the best at whatever you do. And as parents, teachers, friends, and neighbors, and in my opinion, those of us who work in government, it is our duty to resist efforts to deprive all children of an education or to allow them to even think education is not for me. So after 89 years of legal slavery, followed by 60 years of legal segregation and at least 10 more years of active resistance to integration in, edu in education, that's 159 years, folks. When it comes to the education of black people in America, it's not hard to see how resistance has been and continues to be a double-edged sword. Thanks for listening. Good afternoon. My name is Wesley Alexander, and I'd like to thank the Pennsylvania Multi-Agency Planning Committee and the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission for volunteering their time and efforts in organizing this year's Black History Month program. To Governor Josh Shapiro, Lieutenant Governor Austin Davis, and Representative Donna Buller, Chair of the Pennsylvania Legislative Black Caucus, thank you for your remarks and well wishes. For this year's national theme, Black Resistance, we focus on education, the media, voting, and the church. Thank you to our presenters, Julian Elliott and Verna J. Edmonds, Chad Dion Lassiter, Reverend Carla Christopher, and Rick Hicks. We also want to thank Lark Daniel and the Dominican African Dance Community, as well as Jordan Howard. A final farewell to Lenny Lewis, Jenny Kovac, and the Earth Tones. This musical group has been instrumental with volunteering their talents for Commonwealth program events for many years. Thank you. They are Teresa Allen, Norma Swain, Nita Bittis, Wendy Lloyd, Doug Long, Shane Miller, Carrie Ann Priston Simpson, Rachel Renal, Dave Lambert, Lenny Lewis, Jenny Kovac, Tony Shaw, and Arlene Schumann. Next month, the Pennsylvania Multi Agency Planning Committee and the Pennsylvania Commission for Women will be sponsoring a virtual event on March 28th. 
Details of this exciting program will be featured in the Save the Date flyer in the upcoming Employee Bulletin Board. Finally, on behalf of Rhonda Davidson, myself, and the Malta Agency Planning Committee, we thank you for joining us this afternoon as we celebrate 2023 Black History Month. Please complete a brief survey at the conclusion of our program. It will be emailed to those that registered for the program. Thank you.